Do you know your medicine? Weed Maps and SC Laboratories bring you an educational series on the science of clean and safe cannabis. Today's cannabinoid profile is on Delta 9 Tetrahydrocannabinol. Hi, I'm Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, and I've been educating patients about cannabis for a number of years. And today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's the most prominent compound found in the cannabis plant. It was discovered in 1964 by researchers in Israel. Cannabis has been used for many, many years, thousands of years, but nobody knew exactly uh, what was in it. In fact, that same group continues to do research on cannabis to this day. THC starts out in the plant as germinal phosphate and olive acid. Through an enzyme catalyzed reaction, the germinal phosphate and the olive acid are catalyzed to cannabigibarellic acid, or CBGA. The CBGA is the precursor to several of the cannabinoids. To make THC, we go through the pathway catalyzed by another enzyme called THC synthase. It allows the CBGA to become THCA, or tetrahydrocannabinol carboxylic acid. The THCA has very different effects than the THC. Now with heat or over time, the THCA can decarboxylate into THC. This carboxylic acid renders this compound virtually non-psychoactive. And what's interesting about THC, or Delta 9 THC, is that it has so many different effects on humans. And in about the 1990s or so, uh, it was found that humans have cannabinoid receptors, and there have been two identified, CB1 and CB2. And THC binds to these receptors, causing a change in the function of the cell where it's binding. So what are some of the effects or changes that we see with THC? THC is well known to turn off nausea. It turns off the vomiting. It also appears to trigger appetite. It also appears to have effects as anti-inflammatory. In fact, it's been found to be 20 times stronger than aspirin. And it's also been found to be two times stronger than hydrocortisone, a well-known steroid that people use. It's been found to be a strong antioxidant. There was a study out of Harvard that talked about these mice that had these large tumor loads and by giving them THC, the tumor, and I believe they were lung cancer cells, were reduced in half. There's also uh, was a study in humans where THC actually reduced or decreased the tumor cells for this specific type of brain cancer. THC has been found to be helpful for patients with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are a number of current studies going on right now looking specifically at using THC to treat PTSD. THC has also been found to help patients with Tourette syndrome. And Tourette's is very difficult to treat overall because the medications that can help often have very significant side effects, especially in young people. And so THC was studied and they found that the patients had overall uh, less ticks and less urges. SC Labs test for THC using an HPLC, also known as a high performance liquid chromatograph. There's basically two methods out there to test for THC in cannabis. Some people use an HPLC, other people use a GC. The problem with the GC or gas chromatograph is that at the process actually heats the cannabis up and measures it based on the boiling point of the different constituents in, in the resin. Picture trying to weigh a piece of paper by setting it on fire and placing it on a scale. The problem with that is, is you're going to lose some of your sensitivity because the, the paper is changing as you're actually trying to measure it. So that's why we choose to use HPLC to, to test for THC and all the other cannabinoids. No one has ever overdosed on THC and the reason being is that you do not have these receptors, the CB1 and CB2 receptors, located anywhere in the brainstem. The brainstem controls breathing and heart rate. If the THC doesn't bind in that area, it cannot change or turn off, similar to things like opioids. And so we do not see that with THC. Usually a, um, quote, overdose of THC causes a patient to have excessive anxiety. They have a sense of what's called perceived harm. They think something bad's gonna happen to them. They're really in no medical danger. Today's cannabinoid profile is on tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. 
THCA is another cannabinoid found in the cannabis plant. THCA stands for tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. Cannabis actually produces carboxylic acids as opposed to the non-acidic forms like THC. So when you hear of THC in plants, there's actually very little THC in plants. It's mostly THCA. THCA is actually not psychoactive. With heat or with time, the THCA will convert into THC, and that's what's psychoactive. So when we smoke cannabis, we're smoking THCA, but the heat is actually turning that THCA into THC, and that's what's giving people the psychoactive effects that we come to expect from cannabis. THCA has been found to have its own medicinal properties in that it's anti-inflammatory, and it appears to modulate the immune system, meaning it can suppress it or enhance it. What's interesting about THCA is that it can be measured by medical cannabis testing, and it does allow for a patient to know the total amount of THC that's in the plant. So usually when one gets their medical testing results on a certain plant, the THCA will be expressed in percentage. And let's just say it's about 16%, and then the THC may be in a very small amount, but overall added together, that's what gives you uh, the potency of THC. We have a drawing of, of basically the synthetic pathway that THCA takes. So we start out with geraniol pyrophosphate and allotolic acid. They combine to form what's called cannabigerolic acid, another acidic cannabinoid. And the cannabigerolic acid, or CBGA, basically folds in upon itself and it forms rings, which gives us the final structure using the THCA synthase enzyme to form THCA. And THCA we have down here is very similar to THC. The only difference is this carboxylic acid group that's attached to the THCA. So when heat occurs or, or, or over time, that carboxylic acid will release as a CO2 and we'll be just left with THC. Now interestingly, when one tests medical cannabis in a lab, there are different methods, and the method that many uh, labs use is called gas chromatography. Now unfortunately, gas chromatography requires heating up of the plant, so what happens is the THCA actually gets decarboxylated in the lab. And that's why we use HPLC, because um, we feel that the, the acidic cannabinoids play a very important role in, in knowing the ratio between the THCA and THC it is important for judging the quality of the cannabis as well as the effects the cannabis is going to have on the patient. So it's, it's very important. And in with other products such as edibles or, or non-inhaled products, it's much more important because, as I said, THCA has very different properties physiologically as well as psychologically than the THC. It's very important to know those numbers in the non-inhaled products. So you actually have a very accurate measurement of the THC that's in the plant. There, there's a nearly enough study that's gone into THCA or some of these other acidic cannabinoids. Uh, the, the studies that have been done show very great promise in, in, in the possibilities of, of these acidic cannabinoids and different administration routes and stuff like that. So hopefully with the, the work we're doing here at SC Labs, bringing awareness of these compounds and, and showing people what, the, what compounds are actually in their medicine, um, we'll bring around about that awareness and, and we'll be able to inspire people to, to pick up the torch and, and, and carry it further and, and get this research done and, and start start finding out exactly what, what benefits these compounds can have, but there needs to be a lot more research. Today's cannabinoid profile is on tetrahydrocannabivarin. THCV, or tetrahydrocannabivarin, is another cannabinoid found in the cannabis plant and it appears to have an interesting reaction with the CB1 receptor. At low doses, it blocks the receptor, and at higher doses, it binds to the receptor. And what they found in uh, lab studies uh, with mice is that when it blocks, it causes weight loss and decreased body fat and increased energy expenditure in these mice. So it appears to have the opposite effect of THC at these low doses. It's very similar to THC except for a few minor chemical constituents, but it actually starts from a whole different process than the tetrahydrocannabinol that we're used to or THC that we're used to. Most of the cannabinoids that we've all heard of, THC, CBD, CBC, start from a combination of geraniol, pyrophosphate, and olive acid, whereas THCV 
we're starting with diverinolic acid. And the only difference really is the diverinolic acid has two less carbons than the olive acid. So it's, it, it's different in that sense that one of the two starting materials is slightly different. THCV is found in a lot of African land race plants. Some of them have fairly high amounts of THCV. It's also psychoactive, similar to THC. Uh, the effects are described slightly different as more of a psychedelic high. The two compounds combine through an enzymatic process to form cannabigerovarin acid or CBGVA. CBGVA synthesizes to THCVA through an enzymatic process using the THCVA synthase enzyme. So THCVA is, is very similar to THCV except for it has this carboxylic acid group attached to it. And now with heat or over time, this carboxylic acid will release from the molecule and then you'll have THCV. As I said, it's very similar to THC. If you did this, you would have THC. THCV has also been found to be, again, in lab studies with mice, to have some anti-convulsant properties in that it appears to lower the seizure threshold for these mice. Uh, there's not very many studies on THCV and I do know that it's being studied in many labs right now. Certainly it holds some medicinal benefits and it would be great to have more studies so that we could really know what its properties are. We feel the minor cannabinoids are very important to patients and we're looking to, to get patients as much information as possible so they can make the most informed decisions possible. So they will be coming very soon from SC Labs. Today's cannabinoid profile is on cannabidiol. Cannabidiol, or CBD for short, is the second most prominent compound found in the cannabis plant. A lot of the medical benefits of cannabis that are attributed to THC or other cannabinoids are actually due to the CBD content of the cannabis. It has very strong anti-inflammatory properties. And not only does it help suppress inflammation, but there was a study that showed that it also helps the body to not make the chemical that causes inflammation, so it actually has somewhat of a preventive role. Cannabidiol has also been found to have anti-convulsant properties in that it can reduce the seizure threshold for a number of patients. I've had my own patients who have said that once they started using CBD-rich strains, they have found that they have had less um, episodes of their uh, seizures. CBD is synthesized in the plant through the same pathways as THC, CBC. It starts out as geraniol pyrophosphate and olive acid. Those two compounds join together through an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Canagiborelic acid, CBGA, is the starting material for CBDA, THCA, and CBCA. So CBDA synthase, if it's found in large enough amounts, will take this canagiborelic acid and make it into cannabidiol carboxylic acid, which is CBDA. CBDA is CBD with a carboxylic acid attached to it. Now, with heat or through time, this carboxylic acid will naturally release from the compound as it is very unstable and become CBD. Uh, this process right here where we lose this carboxylic acid happens at about 80 degrees Celsius. A number of studies were done where they actually gave patients an overdose of THC to see what would happen when they then added CBD. And CBD completely turned around the negative effects of an overdose of THC without changing the levels of THC in the blood. So that means that CBD exerts its own medicinal, just doesn't reverse THC, it actually has its own medicinal properties. CBD has been found to cause cancer cells to what we call commit suicide while preserving the normal cells. And what appears to happen is it appears to bind to the receptors on the cancer cells which then induce the cancer cell to kill itself. Cannabidiol has also been found 
to be what we call biphasic in terms of sleep. So at low doses, it's what we call alerting. It kind of keeps you awake. At higher doses, it can be very sedating and cause you to sleep. But what's nice about that is you can control whether or not you are alert or you're feeling tired. When I started testing cannabis about two or three years ago, um, we saw virtually no high CBD plants. Almost every plant we tested was high in THC, anywhere from 10% to 20% THC with some outliers on either end. Some plants would have maybe 1% CBD at the max, 1.5% CBD at the max. Now that we've been testing for a while, we see anywhere from 8 to 15% CBD and maybe 5 or 6% THC in these strains. Some strains, we get a 50-50 ratio. It, it can happen in, in, in all different ratios, but what it is is it's a recessive gene in plants. So we have breeders have to actively go and try and breed this back into these plants and find these high THC plants that might have that high CBD gene locked away and, and breed them together and see what they find. And, and really the only way you can know if it's high CBDA is to test it. With testing and, 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 and growers or breeders having access to that knowledge base, we see them coming back and, and, and reversing some of the trends of the last 30, 40, 50 years and, and breeding the CBD back into the plants. Now there have been a number of studies that have looked at cannabidiol, CBD, uh, exerting a protective property to uh, damage neurons. And it appears that in the studies, CBD protects the nerves by inhibiting the process by which nerves are damaged. CBD has also been shown to protect against brain injury when patients or um, lab animals have had a brain injury, CBD appears to protect the brain from damage that occurred to the nerve cells. The studies have shown that it can actually fight MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staph aureus, a, a notorious bug that is resistant to a number of antibiotics. A topical application of uh, cannabis was able to fight the infection and the MRSA was eradicated from that uh, infection site. SC Labs tests for CBD with a high performance liquid chromatograph also known as an HPLC. Uh, there's two different ways you can test for cannabinoids. It's either with an HPLC or with a GC. If you hear of someone testing with other methods, it's probably not uh, a scientifically validated method. But with the problem with the GC is, is that the GC uses heat to test for these, these cannabinoids. And as I said earlier, all the acidic cannabinoids are very sensitive to heat. So the GC can give you no information about the acidic cannabinoids. It can only tell you about the non-acidic cannabinoids. The heat is decomposing these compounds. It's, it's definitely decarboxylating all of them. And you're trying to measure it as these compounds are in, are in a state of flux. And that's just, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. So we use the HPLC because it keeps the cannabinoids in their natural state. They're in their liquid state. There's no alteration. There's no heat or anything like that happening. And so we get a much more accurate and a much more realistic picture of what's actually in the sample that we're testing. One of the important things for people to understand about cannabidiol is it is not psychoactive. That means it does not change your mood, your mentation, um, the way that THC has psychoactive properties and can actually cause what we call the high. CBD does not do that. For patients who are not interested in the THC effect but are interested in the CBD effect, this is a terrific choice for them to have. In today's episode, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein visits SC Laboratories to take a closer look at CBD. Hey, Josh! How Hello. you doing? Good, it's good to see you again. I was really excited to come back and maybe we could talk about CBD today. You know, cannabidiol has been something that a lot of my patients have been asking about and I just wanted to see if we didn't really get a chance to look. All right, it's really exciting. We've been seeing a lot of high CBD strains coming through the lab, so um, let's go move back and I'll show you some results. All right, sounds good. Right. So, Bonnie, I'm really glad you stopped by. I've got some interesting things to show you. We've had a lot of high CBD samples coming through the lab. Oh, great. I can't wait to see it. So here's an example of the majority of plants we see. It equals out to 16.2% total THC and 0.9% total CBD, and that's that's representative of a good 99% of plants we see coming through the doors. So maybe half a percent CBD up to 
one and a half percent CBD. So in comparison, take a look at a, a high CBD strain. This is a Harlequin, a high CBD strain. We have five and a half, five point two percent total THC and eleven point three percent total CBD. These used to be very rare. We're starting to see them a lot more now. So why is it that the THC is so like low? All right. Well, before testing, breeders would breed selectively just for THC content. We don't usually see 15% THC and 15% CBD. The plant still seems to only be able to make so much resin. Well, and I know from scientific studies that I've looked at that CBD is not psychoactive. So for a person who is got some inflammatory condition or some type of other illness who wants to use medical marijuana, they may find that if they're a person who doesn't want the effects of THC, that a high CBD strain is going to give them that medicinal effect without giving them the euphoria or lethargy or whatever it is that they get from the THC. Let me see who that is. Hello? Oh, she's here. Okay, great. It just so happens I think we have a guest who might be very relevant to the conversation we're having right now. Let's oh, great. Go see Let's go talk to her. Sarah. It's great to see you again. You too. Bonnie, this is Sarah Russo from Project CBD. Oh, hi, great to meet you. You as well. So tell me all about Project CBD, Sarah. Well, Project CBD, we're an educational news service and we focus on the reintroduction of CBD as a news story. Over a year, we've eventually seen that dispensaries have begun carrying it and patients have begun using it. They, you know, really like an option that's more functional, they can care about their day. So, you know, I've done a lot of reading about CBD and, you know, you get kind of amazed that something could have so many um, benefits. And so the things that I've read about is, it's, you know, anti-inflammatory, and I've actually seen that with my patients, anti-anxiety, um, um, has anti-psychotic, and also can balance out if somebody has too much effect from THC, it will balance out the THC effect. Neuroprotection and anti-convulsive, anti-emetic, Antispasmodic, you know, it stops spasms. I mean, it's just, it's amazing that one medicine will be able to do so many things. CBD and THC work synergistically and they both have anti-tumor properties as well. Yeah, and I believe there's a study coming out shortly where they've been looking at veterans who've been suffering with PTSD using medical cannabis, so that'd be great results to check out. We actually work very closely with an organization called VAM, which is the Veterans Alliance for Medical Marijuana, and they've been working with their patients who are all veterans, and, and many of whom are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. They've been having great results with the high CBD rich medicine, just, just in helping to alleviate some of the anxiety some of these vets are feeling. Funny, I was on your website checking out uh, Project CBD and I saw that there's a survey for patients. Can you tell me about that? So the Society of Cannabis Clinicians has created the first real world study on the effectiveness of CBD because previously with CBD there have been clinical trials or laboratory situations. It was done in a test tube or with mice and then clinical trials there's been a couple but you know in a controlled setting and so this is the first real world study and it's examining patients in their normal everyday life. And so we work um, in conjunction with the Society of Cannabis Clinicians and we um, promote their survey. And also we're, we encourage patients, anybody who is interested in CBD to contribute news and information to us. If you're a grower, we want to hear about it. What are you growing? If you have a new strain that's just been tested at the lab, we want to hear about that too. We couldn't be doing the work we were, we were doing without lab testing medicine. The whole CBD topic actually is what, is what makes me really excited to be a part of the testing industry. With testing, a lot of times we kind of fall into the trap of what's the highest THC strain. And with, with CBD and some of these other minor cannabinoids, it's, it's great to be able to, to show patients that it's not just about the highest THC score. There's other reasons to test and, and, and it's a, an honor to be able to give patients you know, that, that accurate information so that they know what they're getting and it, it's exciting to be a part of that. I had a patient who is 75 years old and she's cannabis naive, she's never used it before. And I saw her about six weeks after she saw me. I thought she was going to um, be unhappy with her results and that's why she came back to see me, but she actually came back to tell me that she now was off three medications and that she had much more mobility because the inflammation went down. So I think it's just terrific when we have all this information. but. You know, we need to get it out there to the patients. I'm really excited about all of this. This is great between testing the medicine and educating people on CBD. I feel like just tremendous progress is being made. It really is all about educating people and they can actually make really good decisions about their own health, about a loved one's health. And you know, really it's about improving the quality of your life. Thank you all for stopping by. 
Sarah, it was great to see you again. Yeah, you too. Great to meet you, Sarah. Oh, me too as okay, well. Okay, we'll be in touch. <laughs>
is a cannabinoid that's found in the cannabis plant that is actually what we call the precursor to THC and CBD. So it's the first compound that's made. There's an enzymatic reaction which then leads it to be made to change into THC or to change into CBD. Sort of the stem cell, you'd say, of all the other cannabinoids found in the plant. It can form THC, it can form CBC, it can form CBD, um, and even some other minor cannabinoids. It's never really found in very high amounts in plants because as soon as it's created, it's sent along a chemical pathway to form another one of these cannabinoids. But in its isolated form, it definitely has a lot of medical potential. It's a very, very strong anti-inflammatory. It inhibits GABA uptake. And so GABA is a neurotransmitter in your brain. And when it's GABA is inhibited, you actually have muscle relaxation and you have anti-anxiety effects. So it appears to promote similar effects that CBD has. It also appears to have antidepressant properties and it also appears to have some modest antifungal properties. A lot is not known about the medicinal properties of CBG as it occurs in very small amounts and usually is not isolated out to be tested on its own. But it appears that it works in conjunction with the other cannabinoids to give that overall synergistic effect that people get with medical marijuana use. Here we have the synthetic pathway for CBGA. You start out with geryl pyrophosphate and olive acid and those two join together to form cannagibarellic acid. And here, here is the, the, the structure of cannagibarellic acid. We see the COOH, which makes it the acid. If that were to disappear, then it would just be plain CBG. And we can see the, this long chain of carbon molecules, which is able to roll up in, in, in different ways and, and, and roll upon itself and form rings and other structures, which lead to CBDA, THCA, and CBCA. So when we have undifferentiated CBGA, what enables this molecule right here to become CBD or THC or CBC are enzymes and enzymes are sort of helpers to help catalyze these different reactions that have to occur in plants and animals. Normally chemical reactions occur under extreme conditions. Lots of heat, very acidic conditions, very basic conditions, but in the body we have these enzymes which sort of grab the molecule, in this case CBGA, and kind of form it into the new molecule and make, make that energy that it takes to form the next molecule much lower than if it were just by itself. So the enzymes become the limiting factor or the decision maker in what is formed next. If the plant makes a lot of THCA synthase, then we're going to get a lot of THC. If the plant decides to make a lot of CBD synthase, we're going to get a lot of CBD. So the way we can play around with the different levels of cannabinoids is by altering the amounts of these different enzymes in the plant. That can be, occur through breeding, it can occur through genetic manipulation, whatever it may be. With the legal restrictions placed on cannabis and, and other restrictions, there hasn't been a lot of real good research done on CBG and, and these other minor cannabinoids. Hopefully with the work SC Labs is doing, we'll see more breeders and more cannabis patients and more researchers all take note that there's more in cannabis than just THC and, and, and some of these other compounds are very, very interesting compounds. They're all bioactive, so hopefully we can, we can help spur some of that knowledge and to really finish some of this research that needs to be done and unlock some of the mysteries of these, these minor cannabinoids. Today's cannabinoid profile is on cannabichromine. Cannabichromine, also known as CBC, is the third cannabinoid that is synthesized from CBG in the plant. Less common to find a lot of CBC than, than CBD or THC. And it's been found to have anti-inflammatory properties as well as analgesic, meaning pain-killing properties, although a little bit weaker than uh, THC. It's also been found to have antifungal effects and antibacterial effects. In lab studies with uh, rodents to have anti-tumor effects, meaning it kills cancer cells. And certainly that part of cannabichromine needs to be studied further. And right now there are studies going on looking at cannabinoids in uh, killing cancer cells. CBC is produced in the same chemical pathway as THC. It starts out with geryl pyrophosphate and olive acid combined to form cannagibarellic acid. 
which is CBGA. CBGA is the precursor to CBDA, THCA, and CBCA. What happens is canagebaryllic acid through an enzyme catalyzed reaction, and what enzymes do is allow these reactions to take place at normal room temperature or body temperature, whatever it may be. And what happens here is the canagebaryllic acid is going to fold over upon itself, and, and this carbon atom is going to attach over here and form CBCA. And what makes it an acid is this carboxylic acid group that's attached to it. Now this carboxylic acid group is not very stable. Over time or very quickly with heat, it'll kick itself off and disappear and, and, and leave, leave us carbon dioxide and you'll have your CBC. Another interesting thing about cannabichromine is it appears to inhibit the uptake of anandamide which prolongs its life in the body prolonging its effects and we know anandamide has very good effects because it binds at the same receptors that the cannabinoids bind to. Cannabichromine has also been found to have antidepressant properties. Here we have a three-dimensional representation of CBC. Uh, we have the two rings. The black balls represent carbon atoms. The red balls represent oxygen atoms and the white balls are, are hydrogens that are attached to each. The structure is quite a bit different, as I said, than, than THC or CBD. We don't have that folding in and, and the ring structure is, is much different. But it's the same amount of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen atoms. It's just rearranged differently. Bonds are placed in different areas. Patients normally don't use CBC to determine their medication. They are really looking more at THC, CBD, and CBN. But we do know that this cannabinoid has many benefits and certainly warrants much more study. Today's cannabinoid profile is on terpene. So terpenes are the main class of aromatic compounds that are found in cannabis and an aromatic compound, first of all, way back when, when uh, scientists were first classifying compounds, they used some rather ad hoc methods to do that and aromatics got their name because they all have pleasant aroma, they're the kind of compounds that you would find in cinnamon, ginger, pine trees, it's these compounds that are responsible for the smell of marijuana smoke for example. The Cannabis plant produces several terpenoids that, you know, give it, you know, you have cannabis plants that smell like bubble gum, grape, lemon, spices. So cannabis is really an interesting plant in the fact that it can produce a wide range of terpenoids. The main terpenoids in cannabis are myrcene, lemonine, caryophylline, and pyrene. Uh, additionally, they all will contain this kind of structure, which is, this is the very most simple um, aromatic compound, which we call benzene, it has the formula C6H6. It's easy to imagine how if you replaced one or more of the hydrogen atoms in this compound with other organic fragments, you can build up a whole series of different compounds that are generally referred to as aromatics. They're all somewhat similar to the cannabinoids in chemical structure, so they can definitely have interesting effects, and in, in the terpenoids on their own have been found to have different medical benefits. For example, beta caryophylline is one of the few non-cannabinoids that is known to actually activate the CB2 receptor. I mean, it's also um, known as um, an anti-inflammatory. Lemonine has been shown to be somewhat antidepressant, and you have myrcene, which is the majority or, or the major constituent of the terpenoids profile in cannabis plants. So myrcene is shown to also have medical benefits to some extent. You know, the terpenoids are very interesting and, and they give cannabis its, its uniqueness. You know, you have one plant that is a 16% THC plant, you have another plant that's a 16% THC plant, but yet they, they give you somewhat subtle differences in, in the effects they have on you. And a lot of that can be attributed to the terpenoids.